So my wife and I just moved to Thornton and we are so excited about it. We love that we get to be in this city, in uh, proximity to the church that we serve at and that we worship at. We love that we are around the people that we care for and those that care for us. We just don't really love the moving part. This month marks five years that Emily and I have been married, and the place in Thornton will be our fifth place that we've lived at in that time span. You would think with that many moves that we would be experts at this, that moving would be easy. Nope. It is awful. It is one of the worst times of communication for us, and I am surprised that every time I could still look over and Emily is sticking with me. I think back of some of the conversations that we had where uh, I would get a little bit accusatory. Emily, why is this so hard for you to understand? You get in the crawl space, I lower 50 pound boxes down to you. It's easy. What do you mean we need all new decor just because this is a different color house than the last one? Can't you just make the, the old stuff work? Wait, wait, I thought I asked you to do this. Yes, you say you did, but not in the way that I wanted you to do it and I forgot to tell you about. I'm so glad that I've been given the spiritual gift of apologizing, but I'm so much more glad that Emily constantly forgives me. And really, I'm just trying to be a good husband and help my wife grow in opportunities to learn forgiveness. Aren't I great? But how awful would it be if we didn't forgive? How awful would it be if we held on to these difficulties and these times of stress and these slights and problems that we feel, these hurts that we experience? These small issues become big problems, which become catastrophic failures. And we are, just, we are destroyed by bitterness and Satan is delighted. We have an enemy. We are in a real battle, a spiritual battle where Satan tries to lie and accuse. He tries to get us to believe things that aren't true about God, to believe things that aren't true about us and to have us turn on other Christians. And it's this last area, these, this temptation and accusations to turn on other believers that I wanna focus on with our time here together. We see that as we sit in these times of unforgiveness, we grow in bitterness. Paul talks about this very scheme of Satan in 2 Corinthians. But before we can get into our, our passage together, we, we need to give some background of the letter of 2 Corinthians. And the reason for this, if we know anything about bitterness, is bitterness isn't immediate. We don't wake up one day and discover, oh, I, I guess I'm bitter. It's not something that, that happens overnight. Bitterness comes over time. And so we want to look, how did the church in Corinth get to this? Because what we know about bitterness, and this is the best word for it, it festers. A sword that is not treated becomes a festering wound. A bag of trash left in the hot sun produces this offensive, festering odor. So how did the church of Corinth let unforgiveness, let pain and hurts get to the point of festering bitterness? Well, Paul, just after he planted this church in Corinth, he wrote them a letter because things were not going all that well. That letter we know is 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've read 1 Corinthians, me saying things didn't go all that well, you know, that's quite the euphemism. Just about everything that could go wrong in a church went wrong in the church. This is heinous, unrepentant sin. This is people lording their wealth over others while there are deep needs not being met in the church. This is bad theology. This is a lack of love. This is judging Paul, Paul, and saying he's not a good enough leader. You know, the guy who wrote most of our New Testament, they said he's not good enough for them. So Paul writes them this letter, but things are still difficult. So he, he travels and he sees them in person. We hear about this, this visit in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul refers to it as a painful visit. 
Things still weren't going too well, so he writes them another letter. Things still weren't going well, so he writes them another, a third letter that we call 2 Corinthians. And as we see in 2 Corinthians that there is an inability to forgive, but Paul will break that. After all of this rejection, after all of this pain, after all of the hurts that he experienced from them, Paul is willing to forgive these Corinthians. Partially because we see some repentance, especially one individual, he is showing genuine repentance for, for what happened. We see that in our passage but also because to refuse to forgive is to get started on the path of bitterness. We read about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So let's read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let's start in verse 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, but to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you, reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ." So that, what? What's the whole purpose for this forgiveness? Verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul reminds us that we are called to forgive one another. And we see this throughout the Bible. I could spend this entire 25-ish minute message just reading every passage that commands us to forgive, but we would still miss the point of the message because forgiveness is so difficult for us to do. So Paul shows instead what happens when we refuse to forgive, what happens when we continue to hold on to our hurts and grievances and pains. We fall victim to one of Satan's favorite schemes. And the result of that is bitterness. Bitterness comes out of this inability, this lack of desire to forgive. Over time, we refuse to forgive. And so in our time together, I want to try to answer three questions. What is bitterness? Where do we see bitterness? How do we break down bitterness? So one more time, what is it? Where do we see it? How do we break it down? We'll start with what is bitterness? We, we talked about that a little bit. So bitterness is this inability, this lack of desire to forgive. Bitterness doesn't happen immediately. It comes over time. Bitterness happens when someone sins against us, but it's not always about sin issues that we see bitterness. Think about the root of bitterness is when we are hurt but it's also when we have a higher view of ourselves than we ought to have. And when that gets deflated, our comfort is altered. Our, our dreams are dashed. What we want or what we feel we deserve to have gets, gets changed. And so we become bitter. I, I loved and also hated the way Ann Peterson put it in this, this quote that I read. She said, bitterness starts out small. An offense burrows its way into our hearts. We replay it in our minds, creating deep ruts that will be hard to build back up. We retell our hurts to to any available listener, including every sordid detail. We enlist support, pushing us further into resentment. We hear the offending person's name and cringe. We decipher the offense as as intentional and, and our offender as full of spite. We look for other reasons, both real or imagined, to dislike our villain. With each new piece of information, we form another layer of bitterness. We fool ourselves into thinking, no one will know. But anger and resentment have a way of seeping into everything. Resentment is like a beach ball that we're trying to submerge in the water. And no matter how valiant our effort, it pops up with all its vitality, splashing everyone around. How did she get into my head? 
I mean, this is exactly how I've seen it play out in my life when I refuse to forgive or when I hold on to a slight or a hurt for way too long and way too hard or when I feel like someone has gotten between me and what I want. And not just that, but there's been times that I've, I've had grudges against people I've never even met as I, as I take other people's bitterness as my own. Now, it's so important that we say this. We have all experienced hurts and pains and sorrows. Just the very thought of having to forgive someone who's hurt us, who's made us bitter, that could sound offensive. You wouldn't be asking me to do this. You don't know what they did to me. And you're right, I I don't know. But I know how I've been hurt. I'm coming up on 13 years of working in in churches. And in addition to being one of the the greatest joys and delights for me, the people in the church have been one of the greatest sources of of hurt for me. How do they not get it? They're, They're Christians. Why aren't they acting like it? They're not just ridiculing what I do. They're ridiculing who I am or even how can another pastor treat me this way? Not you guys. You guys have been great, but I mean, give it time. I will hurt you and you will hurt me and and we will need to work through that together. And and that will take time. and, And over that time, there will probably be new and more hurts that come. And so in no way do I want to trivialize or or minimize the hurts and the pains that we have felt. Those are very real. And when we say we are called to forgive, we need to understand what that means and what that doesn't mean. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there are no consequences for the people who hurt us or sin or, or are malicious against us. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we just immediately see the pain disappear. Forgiveness does not mean that we overlook abuse or that unrepentant sin just just is, is shoved under the rug. It doesn't mean that our heart stops breaking for the things that breaks God's heart. We all have pains and hurts. We have real reasons to hold grudges but we cannot stay there. Satan wants us to play these grudges over and over in our minds. Satan wants us to cling to this hatred, to these pains, to these hurts that we feel because it separates us from other people. And so we need to move towards forgiveness. It can't, it's not immediate. It's not. The command to forgive is not an immediate command, but we must move towards forgiveness, not allowing bitterness to have a foothold in our lives. This is what we read in 2 Corinthians 2. This man had sinned. They judged his sin, but now they needed to move to forgiveness. And we must do the same. God will write every wrong. It's not our job to hold people accountable or responsible for every wrong thing that they've done to us. It is our job though, to forgive, trusting God in these things, seeking harmony in all things, not allowing bitterness to be in our lives, not falling victim to Satan's accusations of others or his temptations and his schemes to draw us away from other people. We must move towards forgiveness. But why is bitterness a big deal? Why why does it matter if we're bitter towards towards other people? What's the problem? Well, Satan's work is to undo what God commands of us. It's to make us wonder, did God really say to do that? And God calls us to forgive. By making us ignore that, Satan is bringing about bitterness. But there's another command. Satan fosters bitterness inside of us because bitterness is the destroyer of unity. Uh, Flip back to to John 17. uh, Just before Jesus is arrested, just before Jesus goes to die and offer the greatest source of forgiveness the world has ever seen, he prays for his people, his church. 
and how they will live when he is no longer physically on this earth. This is what he prays for his people. In uh, John 17, starting in verse 20, he says, I ask not for these only, meaning his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which, you know, is you and me, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Now, I hope I wasn't being too subtle in my emphasis right there. Jesus prays three times here that we would be unified, especially because just before what we read in John 17, 15, he, he says, I, ask, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus prays that we would be one, that we would be unified, especially in the face of the evil one, of Satan, This is what the church in Corinth was to strive for. They needed to be unified, so they needed to move towards forgiveness. This is what Calvary Bible Church is called to. We need to be unified, and that is impossible with the presence of bitterness. And so we must move towards forgiveness because what Satan will do otherwise, he will find a way to drive a wedge between us. He will make us not be what Jesus prayed for us to be, and he does that by pushing us towards bitterness. That is what bitterness is. And that is why it is so, so terrible. So where do we see bitterness? I think we see bitterness in just about every area of our life, right? We're driving and we get cut off and the entire rest of the drive, we keep replaying how awful that person is. I, we get bitter towards our, our child's coach because they're not giving uh, our kid as much playtime as, as some of the other kids or as much as they deserve. I got passed over for a promotion again. But we said, bitterness is a scheme of Satan to drive Christians apart, to get us to not be what Jesus calls us to be, which is unified. So in this scheme, how are Christians specifically tempted? Where do we see bitterness for Christians specifically? Well, I think there can be bitterness towards other Christians. I I think the first and most obvious way that we see bitterness amongst Christians is when uh, one sins against another person. When we lie, when we steal, when we slander, let's take a huge jump forward when there's adultery. In all of these instances, whenever there is sin between Christians, it is a petri dish for bitterness to grow into. And so we must move towards forgiveness. Not immediately, please do not hear that. We talked about this. We move towards forgiveness, not allowing bitterness to have a foothold inside of us. But bitterness doesn't have to come just from a sin issue. We could see some of the things that other Christians have, or we can look at their life and think, oh, I wish I had that life, or go a little bit further and say, I deserve that life more than them, and we can become bitter. Or someone uh, doesn't line up with what we think Christians should be doing. They don't live a life that we think is what the life that Christians should be living. You know, those, those unshaven, shorts-wearing pagans. And we could become bitter. Or how about this one? how can they claim to be a Christian and vote for that guy? And we become bitter. In all of these areas and more, we can grow in bitterness instead of doing what we are actually called to do, which is grow in unity. So we must be aware of the work that Satan will do to drive us apart and not grow bitter between other Christians. We can get bitter to the church. In this unique time that we're in, we've been able to see this a lot, right? People have grown bitter uh, towards churches about their, their stance on regathering, either because it goes too far or because it doesn't go far enough. But this isn't anything new. We've, we've seen this for a year. People would grow bitter about a church because it doesn't care about the same ministries that I care about 
or because it registers too loud on, on the decibel uh, reader that I brought, or because it's not like the church that's down the street. We are called to love the church, but we cannot love the church if we're bitter. We can grow bitter towards God. In times that we don't have clear guidance, in times that we uh, are, are coming across prayers that don't seem to get an answer or at least aren't getting the answer that we want, in times of loss, we can get bitter towards God. And this grows if it's not examined. We can ignore him. Then we can reject him. All out of bitterness. There are so many places for us to demonstrate bitterness. So what is the remedy? How do we undo bitterness? Well, 2 Corinthians gave us the answer. We forgive. Bitterness is when we refuse to forgive. And so forgiving other people completely destroys bitterness. I, I think the greatest, the greatest call for us to forgive other people comes from Jesus himself. As he's teaching us to pray in, in Matthew 6, he ends that section in verses 14 and 15. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's great, right? Keep reading. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I hope you see how vitally important forgiveness is for us there. But it's hard to get to. It's, it's hard for us to forgive other people. So let's take a little bit of an easier step. Most conflict is a breakdown of communication. So let's seek out those that we feel hurt by and, and talk to them, especially in situations where we have some unspoken expectation that wasn't met. Us going and speaking to someone, sharing with them where we feel that they hurt us allows us to stop bitterness before it even gets started. For this can be hard too. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. Well, let's take an even easier step. We can pray for those who have hurt us. Again, as Jesus is teaching us to pray in Matthew 6, one of the things he says, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We ask for forgiveness, but we also pray for those who have hurt us. We pray for those that we are bitter towards. And this isn't some prayer that Jesus will awaken them to just how awful they are. No, it's praying for their well being. Can we do that? Can we pray honestly and openly that God would bless these people that hurt us? Would we mourn their troubles? Do we pray for reconciliation or are we happy? to keep things where they're at. We must grow and work towards forgiveness. And we can get there by talking to them or we can get there by praying for them, but we must grow towards forgiveness to break down bitterness. Another way that we can break down bitterness is reminding ourselves of just how much we have been forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 says, uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Throughout this entire time, you, you might've been thinking, uh, you don't know what they did. You wouldn't be asking me to forgive them if you knew what they did. Do you know what you and I did? And yet we were met with painful forgiveness. Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us, even though we constantly rebel, even though it is just frequent, unrepentant sin, even though every time it's, God, I'm so sorry, that was the last time I will sin. And we say that every time. And all we are met with is forgiveness. We forgive because we have been so deeply forgiven. One last way to break down bitterness. 
We immerse ourselves in God's sovereignty. In other words, we, are rem- we constantly remember that God is in control of all things. We have no guarantee that the person who hurt us will ever ask for forgiveness. We have no guarantee that they will ever acknowledge that what they did was wrong or, or even that they hurt us. All we can be responsible for is ourself, of forgiving, of not falling victim to Satan's schemes, of avoiding bitterness. And one way that we can do that is we remember that God will make all things new, that he will restore every broken thing, that he will wipe away every tear, that he will judge every evil, that he will provide us with an eternity's worth of security and comfort. And so as we leave, let's take inventory. Who is someone that we are refusing to forgive? Who is someone who has hurt me? Who is someone that that I've just held on to pain too hardly for? Who is someone who got between me and what I thought I deserved? And I've refused to forgive them. Maybe we need to stop and think, is there someone like that in our life? Or maybe you thought of someone from the very moment I said the word bitter. That's who we're called to forgive. C.S. Lewis wrote, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And that's why this scheme is so terrible because bitterness is one of the easiest things we will ever do. But we are not without hope. We have everything we need to be victorious in this battle. We have everything we need to break down bitterness. We have everything we need to provide forgiveness and work towards that by the God who has forgiven us so much. Let me pray. Father, we want to be a church that is what you prayed for us. We want to be one. We want to be united. We want to not be hindered by hardships or bitterness. We want to recognize that we are hurt. We want sin to be judged, but we do not want to stay in our hurts because we know that that does more damage than we can possibly see. Help us to grow in forgiveness. Help us to be reminded of how you've forgiven us. Help us to be reminded that you will restore and fix everything. We could not seek out forgiveness without you seeking us out first. And so let us learn from that to have a a spirit of forgiveness that mimics your love and your care for us. As we go, let us come uh, bring to our mind those who we need to forgive and bring to our mind just what you have done for us. It's to you that we pray. Amen.